whoever's here will be here. That's how I always look yeah. at it. But for me, and I really feel like um, it was important to have this conversation because this is a conversation where most small business overlook and you cannot overlook this in this space. Um, but before we get into, uh, before we get into the webinar, of course we have housekeeping. Let me share. Again, always about connecting relationships. Make sure you put your information in the chat. Um, always understand it's about collabor collaboration. Um, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to send out a survey to uh, determine who's in our community, to determine um, what areas we can segment. Maybe we can set up teams for the IT uh, experience, those who have finance background, administrative. It's, again, understanding who we have within the community. We have 2,500 people in our database. So there's no reason that we cannot begin to collaborate as everyone's looking for opportunities. So make sure you put that information in the chat feature. Um, I am extending the October cohort registration up until next week. Um, we started last night. So if you know anyone that is interested in becoming a federal um, contractor, please have them to go ahead and sign up. This will be the last cohort for the year, as well as we will be increasing our prices in 2024. So it's all about us getting into this game. We also are having the accounting cohort starting on Tuesday. As you can see, and, and the reason I connected with Rose is because uh, based on what they do, I was like, I love you guys because it was a one-stop shop. And I realized they have the passion that I have as it relates to small business. And we work together to make sure that they can come up with a program or boot camp that can take you all through the process that's going to be cost effective for them. So I'm excited about this boot camp because you are learning your accounting system from the beginning. That's the weakest spot for most small business. We just give our stuff to the accountants and we just hope and pray and don't understand really what they're telling us, but we acting like we understand. But it's for, for me, um, most small business, whether it's in government contracting or in any other area, they tend to, this is where I guess a lot of the fraud can occur if you don't know um, what you're looking for. Um, I've had a, a doctors whose office managers, who was their bookkeeper, was stealing money from them, stole $100,000. So you, as the CEO, must understand what you're looking at, understanding um, this space. But we're going to get into that shortly. We also have the bidding on steroids. For those of you who haven't been around or heard about Attorney Chairman, she's the next level after you complete our program. She goes directly to the meet and begin to teach you how to submit bids live in that four week period. Um, you can go back and listen to some of the previous students in June who went through her four week boot camp and Four of them have won contracts. Um, oh, no. I need to meet you, Mr. LeBay. Uh, Mr. LeBay, can you meet? Oh, there we go. Um, yes. Um, Ms. Smith, she did uh, Lunch and Learn two weeks ago. She's won 
10 contracts. Even uh, after we completed that Lunch and Learn, she won another one for $84,000 with SEPTA. This is real. <laughs> it doesn't make sense for you to go through the program and now don't execute what you've learned. So I'm excited about this relationship. That will start um, in, in November. It's pretty intense. So she's she's the doctor's class. I'm the master. <laughs> um, we're also launching our self-pace in November where all 18 classes or sessions are pre-recorded uh, and you can go at your pace. You still have access to the office hours and lab sessions every Tuesday and Thursday. And also make sure you subscribe. All right, let's get into why, why we're here today. Um, let me stop sharing. And let's talk about why we are here today. I'm here today because of my experience from the small business side and really not understanding anything about Telling people how to use it for you to not understanding anything about accounting systems. Um I was only concerned about meeting payroll. I went from a project manager to running a multi-million dollar company and didn't have any understanding of operations. So I was doing a lot of on-the-job training. So it was important for me to find someone who specialized in this area. That was my biggest challenge in that first business. I went through five accountants before I really understood um, that everyone just can't jump in and do this because the government is looking for specific things in your accounting system. So before we get into the conversation about the accounting system, um, I don't know how many of you have been paying attention to the news. That's what we um, teach you in the program is uh, just you can no longer just close your eyes and say, oh, that's just Congress. They're fighting. Mm -hmm. What's going on? That doesn't impact uh, me. But as a small business, it does. And before you all got on the call, Tim and I were talking about um, we've been through in, in this space forever from like the 80s. We're going to date yeah. ourselves. That's yes, okay. <laughs> Yes, we are. Um, and so we've been through shutdowns. We've been through um, administration changes. Regardless who's in office, it's still the same process, and the government has to operate. And they eventually will get on the same page um, because they really cannot exist without federal contractors. You're like we're like their. Um, second hand. Would you agree, uh, Tim? I would definitely agree. Yeah, the the, the contractors are the ones who implement uh, most all of the uh, the policies and and um, products and get things done. Um, the the there are a lot of uh, staff who make the decisions on the government, uh, the uh, the uh, civilian or or the employees, but the contractors are, who are the ones who actually they they hire and they surge up and they surge down. Um, and mm. before I jump on, let me not be rude. Let me have you introduce Rose. Sure. I just right into the conversation. <laughs> That's all right. Just, we I know each other, it. Paula. <laughs> well, sure. Um, my name is Tim Fargo. Um, I am a CPA. I've been with uh, Rose. I've been working for for over thirty years, and I've been with Rose for um, since two thousand six. Rose Financial Solutions is an accounting outsourcing firm where we we um, run the accounting department for uh, small to large, uh, small to growing um, companies. Um, about fifty percent of our business are government contractors. Um, they range anywhere from size to startups to I think our largest ones now two hundred million dollars. Um, and we we do everything from uh, payable support to pricing support to CFO management, um, all of it are bits and pieces. So we have a, a large staff. I'm just one 
I'm a partner, but I'm one member of the team, but our, our team is pretty strong. So, and we, we enjoy working with Paula because Paula is very experienced and she, she has all the different knowledge on the government contract side and, and her team. Um, uh, that boot camp is, looks, is, I've heard a lot of good things about it and even from some of our clients. So it is actually, I, I, I am going to put a sell in for that because that's a good one. Even though I want to talk about our accounting one. It is important to really make sure you understand your accounting and your structure. Paul and I were talking about this earlier, and most um, new contractors don't realize how they need to set their accounting system up. And so they set it up like for tax or they set it up just income and expense. And then when they really need to do a proposal or they need to put some numbers in there, it's, it's a struggle. And then it's not compliant either. So that's that's why it's important to really set it up early. But we're we want to I do want to talk about the shutdown too, Paula. So let's that's going to be important. Yeah, and and most small business don't know their numbers starting out. Yeah, it's like well, I'm just going to put this number in and hope it right uh, it works. It's important that we know the numbers. But let's get into what what's been your experience uh, as the accountant and working with uh, a lot of contractors. Uh, as it relates to shutdown, and I'll tell you my experience yep. on the, both sides as well. So my my experience with the shutdown is we have to get prepared. Um, we have to really over communicate to our staff and to our contracting officers. We need to make sure we have a we contact each one of our contracting officers, to understand what their um, role is going to be in the shutdown and what their understanding is. We are small businesses, so that means that we. There is a prompt payment act. They have to pay us pretty quickly. So it's important to try and get any payments that are open and uh, um, get them processed before the shutdown happens. So right now is a good time to be reaching out, submitting your invoices for the end of the month, like on the first or second, and try and get them paid before that 15th or what I think 15th or 16th, I think is the date that they're they're talking about. Because even if they do extend or make you essential, the payment office is not open. That's not essential. So you're not going to get paid. They'll just um, have you work if you're essential, but you won't get paid until they come back. Um, and then the other thing too is on your for employees, for your employees, make sure you they understand your PTO policy and what, what you're going to pay them for. If you're going to have to let them go or put them on temporary, most people put them on temporary leave without pay until they have it, if, if it extends. Um, uh, it, it is very expensive to try and keep them on staff for multiple weeks. A couple mm -hmm. days may be okay, but if you get into week or two, your staff, you have to pay them and you don't get reimbursed for that. Mm -hmm. So that's the, what I've seen is it's it's important to create a policy for the shutdown and just uh, your staff know what's going on. So they're, they'll hear it in the news as well. So, but you want to let them know before the day it happens. So how do ready. small businesses that, that, um, one to five, one to ten employee company uh, manage that because um, that that could be very challenging. Um, what what are your recommendations? Are? So it's important to make sure we let the bank know and see if we need to borrow some money so we have cash available. And and then if we're talking with a contracting officer, a lot of uh, what I've seen in the past is. They'll come back and they'll give you a special task order or project for the shutdown where your, your employees can bill for that time off so you get paid. Um, but it, it you have to communicate that with that with a contracting officer. If if you don't and they then they aren't gonna they aren't gonna initiate it in most cases, the contracting officers. Mm -hmm. Um and then for cash flow, you have to make sure you have enough cash. So I'd look at how much cash you have coming in and your employees and see if you don't think you're gonna get reimbursed, then you have to let them know I'll I'll give you X amount for your PTO until you run out, and then we'll have to go on leave without pay. You may, if it gets into more than two or three or four weeks, you may lose a few employees, but I doubt you will because most there's no one's hiring during that time either. Um, in my history, I've seen like the smaller ones, they usually maintain all their employees. Um, mm -hmm. It's just, you just have to watch your cash flow. Try not to do any extra spending um, during that time frame. Yeah, it's definitely stressful for a small business at, yeah. that, at that time. And, and that, I, that's where I don't think, um, people understand that impact because yeah. it does impact everyone. It impacts even like in people um, that aren't government contracting, that especially in that Washington D.C. area, because you have restaurants um, yeah. 
And uh, I was actually shocked. Um, I was up there earlier this year and I went to a government building. There was no one there. They were yeah, still, um, still empty. COVID. And so that was kind of weird because I knew HHS, the Hebrew Humphrey building, that was yeah. always people in and out. Um, and it's a different way now. I guess people are having to do business with the government. Have you seen that across the... Uh, I have. I'm we're we're outside the Washington D.C. here in Maryland, so I've gone downtown, and they're they're really trying to get um, the the buildings back open and and at least a hybrid of individuals in there because a lot of the a lot of the corresponding brick and mortar or brick and mortar businesses are going out of business. There's no one there to eat lunch. There's no one there to go shop in the stores, um, and that not just in the D, I mean that D.C. is that thrives on it, but there are a lot of um, situations like that around the country but i haven't seen a um a decrease in the contracting because i uh i've seen a lot more remote um bids come out which means they're okay with remote employees as long as they have the right security protocols and that's a big big area that they're focused on is making sure you have the the compliance the NIST compliance and and um and the uh, any it compliance the cmmc so those are important as well. Uh, are, are they are they really? Is that primarily with one department, or that is that across the board? Uh, I've seen I, across the board, um, especially with the remote work now, where everything's done online. You have to make your make sure your security protocols are are meeting the those the especially the NIST requirement, um, because if, if they can't have someone working remote get hacked into, so it's. And, are, and, are they offering any um, courses or any of the agencies helping small businesses ensure that they have those clearances? Do you um, know? I do not know. I can I can check and see. I do not know, but that's a good uh, that's a good question. I'll um I'll I'll get back with you on this. You can let everyone know. Yeah, yeah, because if that's key, and that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, we. we we can't have we, we can't be hacked with the government. Uh, we don't want to be on that breach list um, because that's a problem there. <laughs> oh, wow, wow! But going back to your question on the shutdown, it, it will be really important to make sure that we're, like you said, watching the news and really understanding. Um, I am myself am nervous. This could be a very long one, um, just because the 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 only thing, and this is a sad thing, but the only thing that could stop it is. We have a, a potential a few wars going on that we're going to try and support, and so if we shut down, that could impact those. So that may be something that would hinder not not shutting down. But with the with the what's going on in the news with the politics, I'm not sure they'll be able to come to an agreement in two yeah. weeks. I think this this is a different shutdown that I've experienced. Yes, um, because it wasn't necessarily in the other shutdowns where you would have an inner fighting whereas right. um here you got inner fighting and it's just it's just a crazy time of the world i see yeah um, and it's a, and it's our business too so it's that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> that's not something you can you can um get around or, or get past um Yes, on a, on my experience um, on the shutdown, I was on the government side, um, and they did reimburse us. That was back in 2013, I believe, and we were shut down for three weeks. Mm -hmm. And even for us as government employees, that was still nerve-wracking. Um, but in the end, you do know that they... They have to operate. They, they have to pass the budget. They have to yeah. pass it. It's just a matter of when and how long everyone can wait out. Do you agree? I, I agree. And it's and it's how long you can wait out and and how much cash you have um, to keep going. So mm. if we can and, – and the only concern as a government employee, I've never not seen our government employees get paid. So that was a benefit. I have seen – some of the con government contractors not get paid so that I, I the only way that I that, well they eventually got paid in most cases where they they were not the agent said you're not allowed to reimburse the contacting officers came up with new tasks that they were able to then work their employees on fixed price tasks and say you know what 
go ahead and do this project for ten thousand dollars, and that should cover this employee's time off and and they just deliver this product, which they know is only like a ten hour project or something like that. So they've found a way that, that's and those are things you really want to get a good relationship with your contracting officer because they're mm -hmm. they they're when they get the budget passed, they're going to have the funds during the shutdown time, but then they can't go retroactively and and have people work, but they can find ways to get around it. And right. I, like I said, I've seen um, multiple cases. Like, for instance, I've seen NASA. They actually said during a shutdown, they're, most of theirs, a lot of theirs are essential. So they've said, if you're essential, you just keep working. We'll find a way to make sure that you're compensated. And so that's that's one thing that I've seen in, in a couple. They actually put that in writing. The contract office put that in writing. Now, now can you define what would be classified in your experience as essential? Um, well, I can't because each agency tells you if it's your essential. So <laughs> I, I do have one contractor who he's half essential and half not. He's like in IT. Um, so what's what happened is if he's on like one of his agencies, he's essential. Another agency, he's just he's not essential. Mm -hmm. So you, that's why it's important to talk to every contract officer and try and get yourself to be made essential. Because if what you're doing is essential to keep them open, and they have pretty, they'll you'll they'll you should know. I mean, they should know right away if you're essential, because that most agencies have their own lists of what they consider essential. And is that typically included in your contract when you sign? Whether uh, they define it, it there? It's usually not in the contract, but it usually is very. Um, open it, it in some cases you can put it in a contract like if especially if you're like top secret or there's certain pieces you say this is a, an essential position other ones they tell you um they'll, they'll tell you if you ask them this is an essential role mm -hmm. or task and if you have multiple tasks some tasks may be essential some tasks maybe not you can and that's one area if they say that some are and some aren't then say can i work on the essential ones during the essential time and then come back to the non essential ones after and i've seen that where the contract officer said yeah reapply all the other people to the essential tasks we may go over budget for a month on the essential but then we'll go under budget on the other ones and then they can they can shift it back the next month and is that strictly on task order contracts because the contracts that i mostly had was cost reimbursement and not necessarily a fixed fee uh, type of contract. It can be cost reimbursement as well. They can do that. Most cost reimbursements have some sort of deliverable that you have to be working through. So it can be, um, if it's cost reimbursement, then they, they if, you, if you're shut down and non-essential, then they can't reimburse your costs, but they can um, come up with a, like that's the one where I've seen they've come up with uh, special task orders for like leave without pay costs. So they said, if you change, we'll, we'll create a task order to pay your employees for time off during that time frame on the cost plus. Then you have a cost, and then you can you can bill it back. Because I never had um, only on one contract. It was a hybrid breed of a, a, a cost plus and a fixed rate. Mm -hmm. My labor was fixed, but the ODCs was like a, a cost reimbursement. That's how they set it up. And yep. so that we don't get, we're talking in government language. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you all are lost. This may be a little bit above their heads. Can you clarify um, what we're talking about? What's the difference sure. in a, a uh, cost reimbursement? I, that's what I had, cost reimbursement plus fixed fee. Sure. You know, a lot of those contracts, they did not issue task order. I just had five employees that I was billing full time on that. So it wasn't necessarily a task order driven mm -hmm. contract. On another one, I had task orders for every meeting and we okay. had maybe up to 30 task orders for each meeting. So if you can clarify for the audience what that really means. Sure. I'll go through maybe the different levels of of, ta of uh, contracts so we can talk through them. The the and, and it's going from risk of the contractor and to the risk of the government and 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 delivery. So the 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 first one I'll start with is fixed price. So a fixed price contract is 
Paulo wants to hire me as a contracting officer. Um, I put a proposal together, said it's going to be ten thousand dollars to do this project. It, it's one hundred eighty dollars an hour. It, it's a hundred hours or whatever the, the calculation is, and that's the amount. However, Paul is like, I don't really want to manage your hours. I just am going to say I'm going to give you ten thousand dollars at a fixed price to deliver this product. Well, um, that's a fixed price contract, not labor, but a fixed price contract. That happens a lot when, when um, you want to take all, the, so all the risk is on on me. I got to do it for ten thousand dollars. If Paula says I have to, uh, here's what I have to do, and it's going to take me two hundred hours. Doesn't matter. I've got, I've paid a fixed price, so I've taken all the risk. Paula's limited her risk to ten thousand dollars as the government, and said that's what my fixed price is. And those are usually RFQs, you were, those quotes, those smaller buys you were. Yeah. Yes. Okay. They're usually RFQs. Yeah. That's usually what they are. And they're, um, and a lot of times it can be like products you're buying or a specific license or a service that you have that's okay. Here's what the amount is. And, and it's, and it's pretty set, but you don't want any fluctuation. There may be some implementation or something like that that, that you don't want to, the, the government, uh, person doesn't want to have to manage the hours they can just say here's what i'm limited to the the okay. next one is a labor hour which is time and materials or it, it, can, it can be labor hours which is i build up my labor hours i say it's it's um it's a hundred eight a hundred dollars an hour uh, it's a hundred hours um here's how much here's what i'm going to bill you at i'm going to bill you 10 hours a month until i get that that time done you have to manage that within there if i don't bill i don't get paid um that's a time and materials one and then i can add on additional what what uh, uh odc's other direct costs like travel or um or if i'm purchasing things for you i put those as odc's and um and then you would still just bill that as a time and materials i don't know yep. if i like that that contract no, no, you don't like that contract because <laughs> that's not good for you. It's 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 because it's limited. It's sort of it's in the middle, which means that you have a I've yeah, I've I've funded you for ten thousand, but you have to work that ten thousand, and and you're not you're not guaranteed. So that's one you you, you don't want to try and get into. Um, and then the the next one is what's called cost plus. So cost plus is. Um, say for instance, I'm billing out the same thing at hundred dollars an hour, but I'm really paying my employee thirty dollars an hour, forty dollars an hour, and then I have GNA overhead fringe in my profit that gets me up to the hundred dollars an hour. When I do the cost plus, is I actually bill them. I, I put on my invoice, I've got forty dollars at at ten hours, so four hundred dollars cost, and then here is my. GNA, my overhead, those rates, and they all actually cost plus. You have to actually bill that based on your buildup of your costs. And, and send and it to the is government. That, is that across any contract? Or that, so cost it's plus? contract. So it's contract by contract. So your indirect rates are across all of your contracts for the company. You do you build it up, you build an overhead rate, you build a GNA rate, you build a fringe rate. As you get larger, and I have one client that's got four overhead rates. Because they're so large that they have a whole overhead just for one contract and a so overhead for another contract. So you can have multiple overhead rates. You can have multiple fringe rates. You know, I realize, but there's a thing called um, the SCA, the Davis-Bacon Act, where you have specific type of fringes you have to give employees. So you want to separate that from your regular employees and have a separate fringe rate for those employees. So when you're starting to look at your contracts, you want to look at your indirect rates and you take those and then you you'll bill out the four hundred dollars and then you'll bill the percentage across the company for the overhead, the percentage for the GNA, percentage for fringe, and then the overhead and then the profit. And that's what you have for cost plus. So it's the cost plus the indirect rates is your build up. So, so that, if, in the and, end and, that, yeah. that that rate, let's if we translate that into a fixed rate mm -hmm. once you add the labor costs in your indirect rate so your call and your profit so that rate and actuality that you're billing the government could easily be from 400 to maybe a thousand yeah like very that. easily yeah it can very easily build that up and the reason you want to do the reason i've seen most um government agencies use cost plus is there's there's a shared risk there, which means that you're not you're not getting you're not 
paying your employees for a product and, and not getting reimbursed, which means you're getting if they if they work 10 hours, you're getting reimbursed for those 10 hours on a fixed price. They may have to work 100 hours to deliver that product. You're still got that fixed price mm -hmm. on a T&M. You have the billable hours, but you're sort of limited in terms of the total dollars, the cost. Mm -hmm. Plus, they say we're going to give you one hundred thousand dollars of total funded value. And then we're just going to manage it and build it up. You tell us when we get to 75%, you give us status reports. Here's what we're doing for the product. So it's um, it, it, it allows both the sharing of the delivery, but also the sharing of the costs. And they know that you're not losing any money because it's yeah. the direct labor plus your overhead GNA and all your indirect costs. So there's nothing left. And then they give you profit. So you, you they know you're making some money. Absolutely. I love those contracts. I, yeah. I, I didn't have uh, a, a risk. Right. Um, can you break down, um, again, that's, and even for me, when mm -hmm. I was in that business, it was always confusing. And that's why I'm glad you're doing the class where you're going to break down what it really means and how and what they should be looking for in their system. Yep. Um, overhead and and what is G gna and that was always okay i don't know which one i need to build to and what what really matters and someone does have a question regarding what does gna uh sure mean? stand for oh so i'll, I'll explain um, i'll go through all of them so um first we'll start with start with fringes your fringes are your fringe benefits that's your health that, that's benefits that you give to your employees your payroll taxes you pay, your health insurance, the time off that you give them, the holiday pay you give them, um, any professional training, those are all fringe benefits. So if I if I pay someone a dollar an hour and I have to and I add up all of my fringe benefits and it calculates to 32 percent, then I'm actually paying them a dollar thirty two because I'm giving them a dollar plus thirty two in benefits. So that's that's a cost of a fringe benefit. That's the indirect rate of your fringes. The next one is, okay, now that I've got an employee and I'm paying them their fringe and their benefits, how am I managing them? How is What is my facilities or what is my overhead to support them? Overhead is direct support of direct labor. That is your project manager. That is your um, your building. Your facilities are often part of overhead. It can be computer equipment. It can be any pieces that relate to the um, to the contract and contract support. We'll see. Um, uh, we have one client who does a lot of travel. So all the, the travel coordinator is part of overhead. They're not direct billable, but they're part of overhead because they're supporting the travel. So that's an overhead. And then so the GNA, overhead is oh. still supporting that specific contract. Well, but... no, overhead is supporting any contract and it has to support a contract. It can't be supporting the company, it has to support a contract. And you can have a specific overhead. So I can I can say, here's my corporate overhead. And if I if I can specifically say I have overhead for this contract only, and I can document it, then I can create a second overhead pool for contract A, and mm -hmm. build that out. So I could say here's my corporate overhead to to maintain. Like I I need a scheduler to do the scheduling. I need a project manager to make sure that I'm managing my projects properly. I need a I need a director of um director of classes to make sure I'm running all my classes. All that is overhead because that supports your direct labor. But if I if I have a specific contract project manager only working on one contract, but they but the government doesn't want to bill for it, they're saying that's not direct billable. Then you add that on to a separate overhead. Okay, and then where where does the owners uh, generally will bill their time? So normally, so the the last one is GNA general administrative. So your owners are going to most likely bill their time between overhead because they're helping support, or in GNA because GNA is really anything that relates to supporting the company. Usually, it's legal, it's accounting, it's mm -hmm. in some cases HR is split between overhead and GNA because you could be if you're direct hiring for contracts or if you're direct hiring for internal. Um, and then the owner, you have to have some portion of the owner or the president or CEO or someone in GNA because someone has to run the company. So that's GNA, but then they can also help support contracts. Usually in small businesses, I've seen my owners break it down into three areas. A lot of times they're working on a contract, so they're direct billable. They're also 
managing the other contractors or the other employees they've got are contractors. So they're all in overhead and then they're managing the company in the evening. So they're split down between the company as well. So they have their labor split down between all three. And, and for me, what I did when I started growing was to minimize my overhead rate. I started billing some of our partners time across contracts as yep. corporate monitors in the direct labor category, just to make sure that I was still being competitive as I compete, because those rates are the ones that you're really on the most part competing against, would yeah. you say? Yeah, that's what you're competing against. And what you just said does two things as a benefit. It increases your direct labor. So that increases the base of your your um your rate, and then it decreases the pool rate. So it decreases the GNA rate. So by moving um some of the owner costs into direct labor and having them actually work on um work on projects, that does allow it to grow and 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 um allow your rate to get more competitive. Yes, because um uh, again, I submitted um uh, a thirty million dollar contract. Mm -hmm. Um, I passed the technical, and that's always the biggest challenge, but I lost on the cost, and I only yeah. lost on the cost by two, two or three hundred thousand oh, dollars. That's it. Wow. Yes. So my feelings was really hurt. I cried. Yeah. That's not that much of a that's not that much of a difference. It wasn't, was it a um have you ever heard it, it wasn't an LPTA, a lower lowest price technical no, performance? It wasn't no, so not. yeah. So wow. No, yeah. it was not. And you know, again, I was doing all of my costs myself. Yes. I did not have anybody with the experience at that time doing it. Um, so I, for me, that's why I keep preaching to everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not just going out and trying to win contracts. Everybody wants to jump and go get contracts. For me, you can't have one or without the other. And having yep. gone through six companies and watching their them and their businesses, their accounting system was always the weakest link uh, because most of them worked on cost reimbursement contracts and we had to submit invoices to them. They had no clue how much they had reimbursed me for. And they just kept giving they me checks. Tracking. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to yeah, get tracked that? Well, let me give you a great example of, of making sure you have the right costs. I have a client who this is this is something that just happened here in, in June. We were working together and, and he was submitting, I think, 15 different proposals um, because they, his name got out and they really wanted a lot of proposals. So he was focused on them and I worked with him on the buildup of them to make sure he was getting even more um uh, a wrap rate which is your buildup of your rates i wanted to get him a little bit more profit and try and try and do some of that fixed price work so we built it up and he had a really good and it's really important that each of our owners here have a good understanding of your rates you have to know what your profit rate is what is my wrap rate i think his wrap rate was like 155 1.55 for every one dollar of labor it's 0.55 of indirect and profit so his wrap rate was 155 i wanted him to bill it like 17 so he can get a little bit more, can hire a, a little bit higher and give a little bit more benefit. And so he's proposed everything at 1.7 and he started to win those contracts. Well, as he was growing, he was taking a few years ago, he was taking any contract he could get. So one of his old primes called him up and said, I got a contract for you. Here's some rates. Go ahead and take it if, if you want it. And so he looked at it and he said, I'll take it if we can win the, the bid. And so after he proposed on it, he sent it to him. And this is somebody he'd worked with for many years who he was really low cost at that point, came back and he had bid 1.31. And I'm like, do you understand that if you pay your employee and you pay their fringes, you're actually paying an extra two, two cents to that plus you have to eat all your overhead for this contract. And it was like 10, 10 bodies on this contract. And luckily he he, I explained it to him. He's like, I should have. He goes, in the old days, I would take that. I'd end up losing money on it. I go, well, yeah, you can see, he can see why now. He didn't win it. He was so happy he didn't win it because it was what's called LPTA. But he wasn't even the lowest price. Somebody mm -hmm. bid it even lower than that. Wow. So wow. He, I'm not sure how they won it, but he, I'm so glad he didn't win that because that would have cost him probably a good $100,000 of profit.
Wow. So wow. It's, um, but that's where it's important to know. And now he goes, I'll never do that again. He goes, and he went to the guy, he goes, why would you do that? He goes, well, I didn't want those, con I didn't want those, those, <laughs> those rates. He goes, and you used to take them. I go, well, now he goes, now I know. Now I'm educated enough. And he goes, my you're accountant told me I can't bad, do that then. anymore. He goes, my accountant called, I can't do that anymore. So yeah. it, it's, um, and so he goes, and it's funny because this same guy is one of the other contract proposals and they won that one together. And he goes, I see you bid that one properly. And he goes, and I'm going to make money on it. So that's, that's why it's important. They, most, most um, contracting officers and even your primes know if you're, if you're, if you're a low bid and, and you may be underbidding. So they're going to, yeah. they're going to try and help you because they don't want you to, to fail. They right. need you to, to do well. They need you to make money because if you're not making money, then you're gonna and, and you're gonna lose employees, and you're also not gonna be able to perform, and it's gonna look bad for them. Uh -huh. And and it still comes back on you. I had a, yeah. a client um, in Philadelphia. Uh, it was at the end of the year, and the government wanted to award a eight A contract that was three million dollars, completely mm -hmm. staff. Oh, okay. Uh, for one year, and so they presented the offer to us and we found a firm that did staffing, um, gave him the offer letter and then asked, I asked him, is your uh, system in compliance? Your, your accounting system in compliance? Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. Okay, so we got out of it. The government negotiated with him, was awarded the contract. And part of his negotiation, he negotiated that he billed them twice a month government okay that but what it did was put them outside of the billing cycle so by wow. december um the government started questioning because now your cash flow should start running right, it should be yeah, that's a big be. payroll off a three million dollar contract for a year yep. um when it came to find came to find out um, he had hired a subcontractor. I think that's what triggered an audit mm -hmm. that the government didn't know about. And the subcontractor called the government saying, I'm not getting, getting paid. paid. Wow. <laughs> so the government immediately shut down and stopped work on that contract until his system became in compliance. Yeah, he ended up having to pay at least thirty or forty thousand dollars to bring in a consultant mm -hmm. to make sure his system was in compliance. Um, but he still had to make payroll because otherwise he was still in the he'd lose, default. He'd still respond. Yeah, he'd be in default <laughs> then. You're right, and that's why it's important if he just set it up right in the front in the very beginning and gone through the the self certification and then had someone come in and just do the initial DCA compliance, he'd know what he's supposed to do and, and get it set up. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's awful. That's, but don't, that's let, help. don't let greed be your driving force. Yep. That's one thing we do talk about in our class. I'm going to put my sales hat on in our okay. classes. We do talk about the DCA compliance, how your accounting system needs to be compliant, how you need to track costs. DCAA. Oh, well, um, defense. Yeah. Defense contract audit agency. That's um, the reason. Uh, so um, all, all our federal contractors have to uh, follow um, the federal acquisition regulations of the FAR. Um, and then DCAA is defense contract audit agency. A, a number of agencies use them to audit um, and perform audits of the um, of your accounting system of your proposals they use DCAA that's the, that's the acronym to do that other agencies have their own auditors and they'll do the same thing that DCAA does but DCAA um, has a checklist of what or far says here's what you have to do compliance and DCA created a checklist of things that you your system needs to to um, your accounting system and your accounting system is not just software it's all your policies your procedures combined together so when you say accounting system don't just think well I got this this uh, this cost point or QuickBooks or something like that or Uninet and that makes me compliant it doesn't it's your policies your procedures and how you're actually using the system and setting it up but DCA comes in you can have a, a um, 
a compliance system three ways. You can self-certify. You can go through and and look at the checklist of the items and say, I do that, I do that, this would meet this, it, and you self-certify. You can hire a third-party company, like we do this a lot, and go in and they do the same thing, They but they actually test it to make sure it's working. Or if you're large enough, and you will get this as you get larger contracts, your contracting officer will have DCAA or the agency come in with their own auditors and test your system. Same thing as the independent third party, but it um it it's their it's their own. What, arm. what does the test mean when you say so, that? So they they run your timesheet. They go through and they look at a timesheet to make sure that that only the employee can fill out the timesheet. Make sure it has to have the approval process. Make sure you, someone else can't fill your timesheet out. Make sure it meets all the timesheet requirements. Make sure your accounting system is set up to calculate indirect rates. You're tracking on allowables. First thing all of them do is they look at your policies and procedures manual. Do I have that conflict of interest policy? Do they have um, the, um, the, the different uh, indirect rate policies and how I calculate my rates? Do I have the, um, they have a whole set list of policies that need to be in your accounting manual that you are communicating with, um, with uh, your staff as well. Uh, unallowables, you have to make sure your staff are trained on unallowables. Make sure your um, your accounting team is actually tracking those expenses that way. So they come in and they actually do testing. Give me a report. I've, I've been through many of these. We've had great success because we know what they're looking for. Give me a timesheet. Show me where that timesheet is billed. Show me where that timesheet gets into the accounting system. They actually go, it's, it's called end-to-end -end timesheet. So they take the timesheet to billing to payment. Take it mm -hmm. all the way through and show me how you take that one employee. They'll do multiple employees, but take that one employee's time. It gets into the system. It's into the contract. Your contract reports where it's in there, all the way into billing, all the way into payment, and then how it flows all the way through, and your system tracks it. And do business owners have to uh, have a timesheet? Uh, well, it depends on your contracts, and it, it you are technically, no matter what type of government agency, is supposed to be filling out timesheets. Um, if you are only fixed price contracts and you're very small, a lot of you're not going to be audited. You're not saying your system's compliant. For your system to be compliant, you need to have timesheets. You need to be recording the time. You need to be allocating your time between PTO, holiday. Um, GNA or overhead or, or whatever projects you're working on. So you you can't just say it's all wages. Your wages are broken down between holiday and and um, and PTO, which go into fringes. So you have to reallocate those that salary over. I've seen that a lot when I get new clients coming on board. Well, all my wages are here. I'm like, well, where's your direct labor? Where's your indirect labor? Where's your where's your um, fringe benefit labor? And and it's not being broken down. And because you also said they also come to you and they'll have uh, files for the taxes. And yeah. Another, another file. Yeah, and that's the first one I've seen is, is usually when they come in and they've never done government contracting, it's set up for taxes, taxable income, owner salary. And it's just like uh, depreciation, taxable, non-taxable, travel tax. It's all tax set up, but you're not able to pull your indirect rates or even, even pull your profitability on it, it's all based on taxes. So that's why for me, it's important that you understand number one, how and what you're reading in those reports. Mm -hmm. Because again, in the end, you're still liable for whatever goes on in that business, regardless right. who, who's doing it. Um, number two is making sure that once you set it up, you're not gonna have to go back and revisit. Right. Yeah. Because right. now you have those policies, those procedures in place. And I only had one audit. Well, I had two things on my first contract. The government knew we were small and that was our first contract. So they gave us six months to get our indirect rates approved. Yeah. And I, again, I didn't know what that really meant. Uh, NIH came over and did mm -hmm. the approval for that yep. indirect rates, which was good because now you can use that as part of your cost proposal, right. stating that this has been reviewed by a government agency and approved. And then when I had to close the business, that's when they came in and did an incurred cost oh, submission. So yeah. Uh, at that time, I had no employees and I hadn't no idea what they were looking for, what that really meant. 
Uh, they just came in. We just had to provide all the invoices, that um, timesheets and everything. And in the end, they ended up paying us, even after yeah. I closed the business, $85,000. That was a blessing because it could have been the other way around. Correct? Yeah, it could <laughs> have. Have you been. Seen, seen it on both sides? And I have. I have it. And I'll give you another example. Um, and you may not realize, we just talked about the different contracting method, methods and mechanisms. One thing that, that I think you might have not known or you didn't, when you go into cost plus contracts, your entire administrative area doubles. You have to calculate your indirect rates each month. You have to manage contract by contract the rates to make sure that you're within those bid rates that you've put in there. And then you have to, in certain contracts, in most contracts, you have to fill out what's called an, an ICE, an indirect, um, uh, um, yeah, uh, indirect rate submission. And what that is, is it's taking all of your contracts, it's taking the full company indirect rates, and they have a specific format you have to fill out. And it's not a small process to do even if you have one contract there's about 30 different tabs you got to take all of your expenses and put them into this big submission it um it, it's very uh, time intensive and administratively expensive so it, it that's why often small companies will not do um cost plus contracts unless you get a large enough contract because yeah. if you got a five hundred thousand or a million dollar cost plus contract you have to submit the indirect rate calculation and in paula's case what happened is she may have agreed to or she agreed to a certain rate her actual rates were higher and mm -hmm. since it's cost plus the incurred cost submission said she was owed more and she hadn't okay. billed it so she got more money it could be the opposite you yeah. agreed to five percent and mm -hmm. you only came in at three percent when that incurred cost submissions in there then you have to give them the two percent back and so you have to be careful with you're monitoring those rates to know that. And um, and often if you have a large enough contract, you may, you look at that every year to make sure you're going to um, meet those rates. And you don't have to. A lot of times you can adjust rates in the future if you think you're way under. So you don't have to give money back at the end. You can give it back over time or adjust your rates. Correct. Correct. Someone asked, Ms. Banks asked, um, what if you are the only employee? Do you have to be accountable for all this accounting? <laughs> yeah, you do. You do. That's the problem. So that's why it's important to to make sure that I have one gentleman who's the same thing. And he he and I talked. He just started his company. He's about to get his contract. They go, you know, you have to do. He was going to do a cost plus contract. I said, why don't you just ask him if you can do a fixed price contract for the next year? Um, because you don't have to fill and incur cost submission. You don't have to track things. And the contract officer said, sure, you do whatever you want. I was just throwing suggestions out there. So it's important to make sure you know what you're getting into. And if it's just you, try and get a labor rate. Try and get um, a cost contract. But you still have to set your accounting system up properly either way if you're small or large like the the fixed price one gentleman we set his accounting system up and he understood it very easily but then he didn't have to he didn't have to submit the the cost plus um um forms or anything like that in year one which is which, okay. again that's going to cost you five thousand dollars minimum for that incurred cost submission so that's why i got in trouble i started out doing my own invoices and I was sending and it was on a cost plus fixed free contract. Yep. And on those contracts, they're looking for three categories, what you build for that month, mm -hmm. um, what's billed um, year to date, and then the cumulative, cumulative. Build in the overall value. And my Excel spreadsheet had a formula in there that was wrong. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and so the government thought they had eighty thousand dollars more than they really did not have. Yeah. <laughs> they weren't a happy camper with me, so that's right. not because I was in the A day program and they understood it was a business development program. They gave me a little leeway, yep. um, but that's when I realized I need to get out of the accounting business. 
and, and that, that and, uh, grade. Mm -hmm. right and and that's one of the testing they do when they go from end to end. They'll look at your invoice and how it calculates to the contract to make sure you're you're pulling that in. That makes your your system and you're using Excel, which a, a lot of small businesses use Excel for contract management because the contract management software is expensive. So you just have to make sure your 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 everything ticks and ties. Yeah, and again, an accounting system to me is only as good as who's putting the information. Yes, in. <laughs> you are one hundred percent right. <laughs> You're one hundred. At Rose, we try and use a lot of automation versus data entry. A, we don't we don't want our valued staff to be on typing stuff, and B, if you have the automation, you know the number is going to be coming electronically over. So it's uh, that's that's important because yeah, one one zero a missing zero, depending on where it is, could cost you a lot of money. No, I had one accountant again back then. She was dealing with a general ledger. I had no clear clue what a general ledger is, but one of the other partners had an idea, and he pulled the general ledger and he saw where she was erasing and backing out. Oh, yeah. He knew this yeah. was good. No. <laughs> I didn't know. Yeah, <laughs> you know, how would I know? I don't yeah, know exactly. Those numbers with me. That is a good point, though. You want to make sure that you're closing down your books each month mm -hmm. because you don't want and you and you and if you're using like QuickBooks Online, you put a password in there that says it's locked down. Like we do that every single month when we close it, we lock it down because I uh, someone could be in there and they type in 22, 2022 versus 2023 and all of a sudden expense goes in the wrong period and now – your transactions are all messed up or they delete a trans current transaction, but they delete all the prior ones by accident too. If it's not closed down, it will let you do that. So you just want to lock it down and say only you have to enter a password to make any prior year changes. And I think for me as a small biggest business, the biggest mistake I made was purchasing that Dell tech system yeah. at that time. The government was like, you need to get a Dell tech. I understand it. I understood it after I bought it because yeah. you can't manipulate Dell Tech like you right. can QuickBooks. But right. again, to me, it still is it's only as good as who's keying in that information. Right, and and uh, the and the and the cost for that extra benefit is is pretty high for the Dell Tech cost point versus the QuickBooks when you can set procedures in there that do that same thing of locking it down. But you, that's the decision you want to. Make if you think you're going to get a ten or fifteen, twenty million dollar contract, then you, you want to make that investment in a strong software. But if you're still growing, you want to um, incrementally ramp it up. Like I have most of my clients start on QuickBooks Online and they set the procedures around that, and then they'll once they get large enough, they'll move up to a, a larger system. And that system just helps on the controls, like you said. It it doesn't allow for transaction. Um, historical posting and periods and, and it has batch posting, those type of things. Um, and it cost me $17,000. I was going to say, <laughs> it cost you $17,000. That was back in 2000, the early 2000s. Yeah, and now then, that's probably 50000 <laughs> And then you had to pay $2,500 or a, a quarter for tech support mm -hmm. and then finding someone that understood Dell Tech language. And we are yep. close to the oh, end. Yeah. Um, I, again, want to reiterate that they will be starting this boot camp on um, uh, Tuesday, I mean, Wednesday, um, from 6 to 7 p.m. They're set up just like we have set up. There's a typo, so I know the typo. But the goal is that you walk away and have an understanding of what's in your accounting system that you can take advantage of this, uh, those four weeks and this experience. Know for yourself. Yep. It and we'll, does, we'll help you. And the only other thing on here is we're, we won't have that one the week of Thanksgiving. We're going to do it the Wednesday after. Correct. So we're going to do the Wednesdays, but it's the, the, from the, the last session we did, we've got a really good responses. People are, our, our participants and students really, really had a better understanding of, of what, what their financials look like, why you, why you build their, your chart of accounts the way you do. I mean, part of this is, it's not just me talking or our team talking. It's, you actually have to build your QuickBooks online database 
and you have to put in your chart of accounts. You have to run financial reports. You have to put in transactions, and, and it and it and work in different scenarios. What's an unallowable? Um, how do you put those together? How do you build up your indirect rates? It's it's um, pretty informative. Um, and uh, I love it. Um, and our goal with all of you guys is to build relationships. We want to start with you and be proud when you start winning your million dollar contracts. Um, but initially, it's about you understanding it yourself as the business owner. So I hope you guys uh, take advantage of this. We we do have to have a minimum of at least 10 people to right. participate and for it to be cost effective. Um, Tim, do you have any closing thoughts? Just um, we'd like to see everyone next week. I think just get ready for the um, the government shutdown contract. Uh, reach out to your contracting officers. And uh, make sure you let your employees know that you're going to be monitoring the uh, the shutdown. If something happens, you're going to let them know um, how you'll be able to handle it. You don't know right now because there's no shutdown, but just keep that communication open. Start early, start now, and and um, and then your a your employees will appreciate it, and b you'll have open communication. All right, thank you. Um, thank you. Tim, I'm going to actually put this recording in some of the other some of my 8A firms so that they can understand those who are playing and what, what the process should take. Um, can you give them your number in case they sure. want to um, put it in the chat? I'll, I'll give the number. So you're recording um, my, mm -hmm. uh, my, my email address is tim.fargo at rosefinancial.com. And my direct line is 240-813-1712. All right. Thank you, uh, Tim. Thank you to the GPI community for joining us. I hope this was fruitful for you guys. It was fruitful for me. Um, and I'll take one takeaway before I close out. Can I get one takeaway from someone? Uh, Tim and Paula, this is Fran. Tim, thank you so much for sharing your insight today. And Paula, truly appreciate uh, your just candor and your experiences. My takeaway is has been a number of things, uh, you know, as you described, the types of contract cost plus, uh, fixed fee, you know, all those, uh, the, the options that are available, understanding, you know, in times, tumultuous times, uh, what we need to be prepared for in the event of a shutdown, and uh, understanding that selecting the right um, accounting system and support is, is crucial in all of this. And I'm, I'm new to this space and truly appreciate the sharing today. Thank you so much. Perfect. You're Great welcome. You. Thank you. And this is open to everyone, even if you're currently in the cohort, you're still going to have to uh, have this regardless. And you need to know. So again, thank you guys and happy Friday and have happy a great Friday. weekend. Thank you, thank Tim. You. Again. Thank you, Paula. Talk to you later. All right. Bye-bye.